Welcome to This is Africa on Capital Radio. We're in the segment of the first show on Capital Radio of This is Africa. And gone just like that. This segment is called Unplug the Matrix. If you watch the movie The Matrix, watch it, understand the reference. We're offering two pulls, the red pull or the blue pull. Blue pull, you imagine life is just fine and go on with the rest of your life. The red truth is how you can know the truth and make a difference. That is so in this segment of the show, we're very excited to welcome Alvaro Peterson and Mohammed Zunaid Nanabai. Alvaro is a former pro world record holder for the most consecutive limited fisheries. And Mohammed Zunaid Nanabai is a former cricket administrator and umpire. He's also a member of the, or he was a member of the South African Cricket Transformation Committee in 2000 to 2001. And we're talking about cricket, racism, and hashtag Black Lives Matter. Let's move the mic over to Alvaro first. Alvaro, you've come up courageously about painful racism in cricket. And it's not easy. I mean, I'm, I'm reading the stories and I, I feel that pain because we're human beings at the end of the day. And no one should have to go through those experiences. Can you share with our listeners and viewers, both the racist and the non-racist alike, who are hopefully watching and listening in today, some of your experiences and those of your colleagues and peers who are really standing up and speaking out. Well, you've heard the stories of many former cricketers, um, their struggles and challenges, their fears, um, but through all of it, also their achievements despite the odds against them. Um, and while I wish not to regurgitate what, what was already said, I think it's important that we understand that systemic racism within cricket exists. And um, I'll actually go as far as saying that it exists in society as well. So how much longer must we continue to emotionally exhaust ourselves um, trying to address systemic racism <clears throat> in the face of ubiquitous denials that operate in our sport and society? But then again, who would want to be alerted to something or a system that benefits them at the expense of others? Powerful opening statements there from Alvaro, just giving us that context about structural and systemic racism in sports and in society, and the fact that people benefit from ensuring that the status quo remains the same. But Alvaro, just for people who maybe have not read the articles or seen, you know, the sound, the sound bites or heard the sound bites, etc., tell us about some of those experiences that. You know, when you when you were going through them or when you knew one of your colleagues was going through them, you wondered, if it, is it worth it to put myself through this kind of abuse? Is it really worth it? Well, I think ultimately it will be worth it because, you know, we, we're not doing it for ourselves, especially not now when our careers are finished. But when we still played, it was about, you know, just almost um, accepting it and moving on. But knowing that it is happening within, within our system, and, and which was hard, because you can see the injustice that either yourself or other players are going through. Um, but, you know, you still had to come up uh, with a way of dealing with it. And then also you have to come up with a way of supporting that other player in under making him understand or them understand that, you know what, you're not alone in this. All you have to do is just put the performances together. So it's almost like an extra burden on everyone's shoulders in order to perform for their country. Mm -hmm. That solidarity is so important, that intersectional solidarity. Some of the examples that really, really hurt me was, um, you know, obviously Makai's experiences of feeling lonely and then and, and running to the ground to avoid having to sit on that bus and be isolated. But also what you spoke about, you know, having to abuse black players from other teams, opposing teams, just to cut them, cut them down a lot. And it sounds to me like the times of slavery where black men were broken in so that the exploiters could could continue exploiting them. I mean, it's it's horrific. And and while we may have just got on with the game, there's certainly the psychological trauma that needs to be addressed. But really, our, our solidarity as a nation is with all the players who are standing up against racism in our country and around the world. I want to move the mic over to uh, to MZ now, um, Mohammed Zunaid Nanabai. Please, can you share with us your experiences because you worked as an umpire and of course your experiences of racism in cricket, both on and off the field. Yeah, you see, for me, it's been not just about racism, but about racial prejudice. And you know, it's uh, from the outset, there's always been many, many instances. And my belief was always 
that many times is out of ignorance, a lack of understanding, a lack of empathy, of having been brainwashed from both sides of the divide, you know, which makes people react in a certain way. But I remember uh, being in an area which is predominantly, to this day, still quite very conservative in thought, having done club cricket matches and at the end of the day where uh, predominantly white uh, team players wouldn't even bother shaking a hand, you know, or um, being told, like giving a compliment by a provincial player, but not understanding the type of language he's using is like, and I, may I say it in Afrikaans, is that fine? Yes, sure. Okay, where a, a, a provincial player once told me, Viet, to jy begin het, het ek gedink, wat weet hierdie koeliekie van cricket, maar om eerder te wees, jy is die beste wat ons nog in my provincie gehad het. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, for, for well, that, it might translate be... That, translate that, Mohammed, for people who don't understand yeah. Afrikaans. Okay, you see, so basically he said, you know, when you started off, I thought, who is this Kuliki on the field? What, do, what does he know about cricket? But I must be honest that you're the best we've had in our province. Mm. You know, so from his perspective, he may be using the word as if it's a normal thing for him, not realizing yeah. the, the hurt a word like that will uh, cause us. You know, uh, so but certainly again, a lot of education that needs to happen, yes. but it starts with the empathy, right? Before you can educate well, someone, sure. they need to have empathy. You see, but I've been fortunate, you know, I have very close personal friends across the racial uh, divide, you know, who have, have meals with me and at my home. I have meals with them at their homes, you know, and I've always maintained uh, it's more about let your performance do the talking. It's uh, easy to get upset and angry and want to retaliate, but, you know, because as a former, as a teacher as well, I used to have the same incident with my uh, learners. They used to finish with matric and go and study and things. I'm talking of the late 90s now, and they come back to me. Some of them, like especially my and my my colored and my Indian learners, used to come back to me crying and say, "But so we go for interviews to the bank, and they tell us we're not uh, a black African, you know." So in today's mm -hmm. times, that's a reality. I mean, I was out of the country for the last 10 years. I just came back due, due to personal uh, circumstances. And I had hoped to get back into cricket circles where I still have many uh, close contacts. And they just told me quite frankly, they said, look, right now for you to get in will be basically impossible because everything is about black African. So while I experienced racism in a form previously, it's like a reverse, like I'm still, I, like in today's time, even though, although we have a new government, if we go and fill in official documents, there's still racial profiling. I don't know what race you belong to. And I think the entire society as a whole, if you look at the tension, the toxic environment we have right now, it's just adding fuel to the fire. Mm -hmm. So I think on that point, it's not that there's not enough opportunity. It's those that, const that control the structure make us fight against each other for the little opportunity, the breadcrumb opportunities that they put in front of us. And so then we have to think in terms of, in terms of race all the time. And that's the way the society is actually structured. It's not broken. It was actually designed that way. But some very important points coming through there from uh, Mohammed Zunaid Nanabai. Um, Avaru, let's come back to you. Racism's always existed, right? Like sexism, like elitism um, in society, as you've just mentioned. But resistance to these isms has always existed as well. I took a look at some of the reactions on social media. On Makaya's story, if I could count over 300 laughing reactions to Makaya's story, and I had a look at the names of those people. And for a second, I wondered, is this real? Are people really laughing at the pain that this human being experienced? Or is this some sort of Bell Pottinger type campaign that's going on that's, that's utilizing a very real experience to create a further problem? But there were laugh reactions, over 300 of them at last count. But there have been some extreme reactions uh, to this um, anti-racism uh, Black Lives Matter campaign. And I've seen you fending them off beautifully on your Twitter as well with, with courage and with dignity and with, um, with the truth. And some of those reactions include threats to boycott TSA and to boycott cricket over the Black Lives Matter movement being you know, a part of South African culture and society. Why? Why are people so threatened by resistance against injustice, specifically in cricket, Alvaro? Well, I think firstly, racism is widely regarded as an ongoing problem. And sadly, since apartheid, it remains an institutionalized problem. 
But we have to overcome this ridiculous legacy of apartheid, first of all. Secondly, there has been a miseducation of the South African mind um, because too often black people must qualify their positions. And then thirdly, and most importantly, some will always feel the need to hold on to a system that will benefit them. And I said it earlier, if something benefits you, why do you want to be alerted to it? And I think that's the reason why some people are still holding on to this, holding on to power, and holding on to something that they feel will benefit them. Yeah, absolutely agree with you on that one. Just the reactions, though. I mean, people are really angry. <clears throat> you know, they think Black Lives Matter is out to destroy cricket, it's out to destroy the country. There's no real problem. And my very favorite one is the All Lives Matter hashtag because they just don't get it. And it's about emphasis. It's not Black Lives Matter. It's Black Lives Matter, right? That's what we're yeah. actually saying. And if all lives did matter, we wouldn't have to have a hashtag Black Lives Matter campaign. It's about as simple as that, you know. Um, but, but really, behind all of it all, especially in cricket, it's those who benefit from, from the existing status quo that are behind, uh, you know, this, this onslaught of negativity and threats and threatening to boycott and probably pull out funding. So I'm sure CSA has a lot to talk about and a lot to think about. I did invite them to the show uh, during the course of the week. And just to be honest, initially the answer was yes, we'll do it, we'll be on the show. Uh, and I specifically said, can I have a female representative from CSA? So we have some balance here going on as well and intersectional <laughs> solidarity. And yes, the answer was yes, I even had a name. And a couple of days later to say, you know what, um, we're now going to appoint a task team and uh, we can't comment any further. So I said, okay. When is the task team going to be appointed? Is there going to be a press release? And I didn't hear anything until the, until this morning, when, uh, just before today's show, to say they okay, now there's a press release, which which we all have seen. But that's some context. CSA is under heavy pressure, and the pressure is important. I think it's very important from all sectors of the society, not only those involved in the cricket space. Okay, so so um, I want to I want to ask um, Mohammed Zineid this question: What are your thoughts on and your advice to? cricketers in 2020 who are now standing up to racism because you've lived through the apartheid era. So what are your thoughts on the fact that they have to do it again and what's your advice to them? Okay, see, I think the, the fundamental thing is it has to be a mindset change. I was part of the provincial as well as national transformation monitoring committee and then targets are put in place, for example. But until we don't change our mindset and our thinking, nothing much is going to change. I'll give you just a few examples before I elaborate on what the modern cricketer should do. I remember in, was it 99 or 2000, where the school under 17 provincial team in Northwest was being selected. And as a board, we weren't really uh, in control of what was happening and the schools had to do it on their own. And there was a young black bowler, not coming from one of the prestigious schools, because unfortunately, and that exists still today, they look at non-white players at the prestigious so-called cricketing schools and really overlook the others. In any way, what I observed, the best bowler on merit was this young black bowler. But those days, the transformation target, I think, was eight white players and three non-white players. Now, what people didn't understand was, first and foremost, you had to select on merit, irrespective of race. Because on merit, you could have had five, six, seven non-white players. But how they did it back then, the white selectors would make sure the eight white spots were filled and then fill up the other three spaces and predominantly will use non-white players who are attending the more elitist schools. And this youngster was not selected. And I went to him afterwards. I said, you know what? This is shocking. On pure merit, he's your best, your quickest bowler I've seen here. <clears throat> Long story short, he wasn't selected. But what just was the prior response, Zunaid? What was, what was the response, uh, Mohammed uh, Zunaid, to, to you making this that, statement? Well, look, <laughs> I, like, like I said, they had their own structures in place, their own selection committees and things. I just made my views felt. In any way, just before the tournament, one of the other black players had to withdraw because for one other reason. And this black uh, youngster who had been overlooked was then made part of the team. And lo and behold, in the first time in the history of the province, an under 17 youngster made the South African under 17 team. And it was this youngster who they had initially overlooked. 
That youngster mm. went uh, on to play for the province, and he also played a few games for the franchise team. I will mention his name was uh, Vusi Masibuku. Mm -hmm. was, a young, was a youngster who initially they had overlooked. Secondly, having been involved in development structures, you know, people have a lack of understanding. Uh, we used to have what was called centers of, of excellence, where all the only facility we had was a steel netting with a cement slab and a mat on, and this was without any field to practice on and things. And this is where our youngsters practice on. And then on a Saturday, they go on, they have to go and play a match somewhere on a proper turf uh, pitch on a field, which they're not used to. While you have the privileged players with their parents sitting on the side of the field with a cooler box, with power aid, with water, with packed lunches, you have these youngsters who maybe didn't have a meal the previous evening, who had no food that morning, who have tattered and torn uh, techies, and who are expected to go and play a 50 over game. You know, so we used to ensure at least that our coaches were given money to buy them a meal in the morning, to at least to sustain them for the day. Uh, mm. Secondly, we look at uh, facilities. You know, you have the privileged schools who may have 15 to 20 turf proper nets. You have four or five proper fields. So again, it's a, it's a very sad situation. Even in today's times, if you look at it, predominantly the players coming out of the less fortunate areas don't have the same type of facilities, uh, the same type of uh, economic social background the same kind of advantages when you go to the field, no support, uh, you know, uh, so despite this, they try, they try their best, you know, and yes, there are limited resources and unions try as much as they can to assist because I was part of it, but without proper funding, especially, I think government needs to come on board as well to assist more in trying to uplift and create opportunities in a proper sense of the word, because it can't only come from one source of, 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 of income. But for today's youngsters, uh, you know, if you have an opportunity, make the best of it. Let your performance do the talking. Don't try, firstly, don't feel entitled, because unfortunately also we have some who feel entitled. Now, because of my background, I should be in the team. It shouldn't be about that. I remember when I went for my interview, for a regional umpire manager, the first thing I said to the panel there, if I'm here because of the color of my skin, tell me now and I walk out. I will not be used as a token. If you appoint me, it must be because you feel I am the best suitable candidate for the for the for this position. So for, I was the first and only Indian undergraduate uh, student at Poch University, but because I was non-white, I my first two years I had to go to class after hours. And even there, I used to get asked, but don't I feel out of place? Mm. My response is, why sure should I did. feel? <laughs> I didn't. Did <laughs> I don't, because I don't look at color. I said, you know what, if we cut the skin, the blood is going to be the same. If you have the same morals, the same ethics, the same values as myself, then there's no issue. So in every box of tomatoes, you may have one rotten one. It doesn't mean you're going to throw the whole box out. Likewise, in Absolutely. society, you have mm -hmm. one, two rotten elements. You can't generalize that everybody is like that. Sure. We've got a comment here from Mushtaq Sheikh, just uh, following on what you just said. 2020, and we're still having conversations on racism in South African sport. What are bodies like Cricket South Africa actually doing besides controlling funds and paying themselves? We need a change. CSA must fall. And he's created a hashtag called CSA must fall. Um, and it's an important conversation because we have to shake the structures of power for a difference to actually be made. But let's move on from there. Um, Alviro, what in your view, I mean, look, there's been this press statement which I've sent you and um, it's entitled uh, Cricket for Social Justice and Nation Building, released on Friday, uh, the way they've noted the issues that have been raised and there's been an outcry. So the Transformation Committee has now developed a sustainable response strategy under its project Cricket for Social Change and Nation Building. Um, there's going to be a transformation ombudsman to include uh, an independent complaint system, to have a national inviso, I love that word. Um, there's going to be, a, we're going to engage in healing and restoration, a restoration fund, I thought that was interesting, to deal with opportunity costs that was uh, due to discrimination, promote diversity, um, and then there's some quotes at the end from Chris Menzani, 
uh, Yevgeny Akula and uh, Jacques Paul. Some interesting quotes, I think. But I want to ask you, Alvairo, I mean, is this the magic formula, do you think, having read that? Or in your view, what needs to happen to overcome racism in cricket? Well, firstly, I think uh, there's a thing in law um, that says that sometimes something is procedural um, and other times it's uh, the substantive thing that matters. And mostly in law, it's the substantive things that matter. And there needs to be an acknowledgement, not a denial. So anything you can create, you can destroy. So racism was created, it can be destroyed. And the continuation of suppressing black people is demographically unsustainable, given the country we live in. Um, and, then, and then finally, what we need to do is we need to commit to healing the divide and create a culture where each person feels seen, heard, supported, and valued across the racial line, whether you're black or white, if everyone feels that way, that's when you're gonna get the best out of players, the best out of people, and the best out of the system. Absolutely, short and sweet and, and a powerful, I would say, uh, as well. Uh, Mohammed Zunaid, you've heard that press statement. I just want to read to you. You've heard what they plan on doing. Mm -hmm. I just want to touch on some of the comments from, uh, you know, the ones that are that are higher up. The board wrote to the Minister of Sport, uh, the Portfolio Committee Chair, about the board response strategy, uh, and that the Ombudsman will be appointed by the end of August. Independent Director and Transformation Chair, Dr. Eugenia Kula, will lead the process of ensuring that the SJM process maintains integrity. Chris Nenzani says we're sorry that our cricket players had to endure, endure these emotional hardships subjugated by their peers. Uh, this is the first of its kind project. And uh, you know we're not going to be held ransom to racism. Basically, Dr. Eugenia Kula adds her voice to say transformation needs to happen in our lifetime. Hey, lifetime is long, eh? 26 years and the lifetime is still <laughs> continuing. <laughs> and um, she says the office of the Sambasman is a solid brick uh, that we can use as the foundation. And then Jacques Paul, the acting CEO of CSA, says it's a challenging time. Of course it is. Uh, we need the buy-in from all of our stakeholders, which I thought was an interesting comment. But we commit that never again will we be found wanting. Is this the magic formula, Mohammed Zunaid Manavai? Is this going to achieve or is it more of the same? And uh, um, if so, what needs to happen? What, would, what advice like, would you give them? Like I said earlier, it, is, it has to come from the heart and a change of mindset. We went through this process 2000, 2001. Like I said, we had a big in Dabas, Cricket South Africa, in Rustenburg, I think it was. We formed a national monitoring committee headed by Prof. Andre Oydedal. Dr. Ram Saloji was serving on that. I was on that. And yes, we had all those hundreds of people signing off and agreeing. But until there's not a change of heart and mindset and people get really buying, it's pointless you putting things on paper. I mean, you can't, you can't force it. You can't enforce this. Mm. You, can't, you can't tell a person, this is transformation and you're going to abide by this. If they, it doesn't come from within, if we don't realize that we are all God's creation, we are all one, we need to hold hands together for the benefit of ourselves and our future generation. Nothing much I feel is going to change until people can acknowledge firstly that there are differences. We've been created different, but there should be tolerance. There should be respect. We should accept and learn to grow from our differences, not uh, try to stir the pot, as you say. And you know, sometimes, unfortunately, media themselves will, will report on a certain perspective or out of context, and they push this whole issue. If you look at the country right now with farm killings, with uh, the virus situation, with people losing their jobs. Um, you know, it's, it just adds more pressure all the time. And people look at different avenues of how to express their frustrations. And the innate differences in the racial divide is something that's being perpetrated from all sectors, not only in sport. So if as society, we can come together as one, then sport should be a non-entity because it wouldn't be an issue at all. So it's pointless in saying, what can we do about it in cricket or in sport? It's about our entire community, our, con our country, our society. Until we don't learn to accept and embrace each other and be true brothers and sisters to each other, nothing much I feel is going to change, irrespective of mm -hmm. what in Darbas we're putting and what we're saying and what policies we're putting in place. It has to come from the heart and the mind. Absolutely agree with you. It has to start there. Otherwise, what's what's the actual point? Doing the same thing, expecting a different result is a sign of insanity, according to Albert Einstein. Okay, before I turn the final word over to Alvaira, I want to...
was um, the fans are traumatized, disappointed, angry. And, you know, we've had bus tickets certainly is way up there in terms of one of the favorite sports of our country. What do you say to the fans who are now feeling lost in what's going on and trying to find their way through? Do I still, you know, am I still supposed to be passionate about cricket? Which side of the line do I stand on? Do I just ignore that this thing is happening and just watch the cricket? What's your advice to the fans? Is that a question to me? You just broke away there. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to ask you the same question, but I'm okay. asking, I'm going to give you the mic last, Elvira, on that question, right. but I'm asking uh, Mohammed Junaid Nana by that question. What, what's your words to the fans? What do you say to them? Look, those who are really passionate about the game will always be following the game. Okay? I would, I would assume and hope and pray that the fans would want to see everybody embracing them, uh, each other for the good of the game. That we can get away from the racial divide, from the tension, from the politics in the game. That uh, everybody be, be given a fair and equal opportunity and that they should be treated equally as well. So that we can focus on what's important, the love and enjoyment of the game. That's what it should be all about. It should not be about whether you are white, black, Indian, yellow, pink, brown, doesn't matter. It's about who is the best possible people to represent us, who are there to entertain us, and we can enjoy good quality cricket. All right. I'm going to turn the mic over to Alvaro for <coughs> final words. Alvaro, and let me change the question slightly. What are your words of advice? What do you want to say to the young kids who are watching what's happening right now in cricket and thinking, I have had, I love this game, but do I really want to get involved in this kind of space where there's racism for 20 years, during 20 years, and done? Well, you just, you just broke up there slightly, but uh, I got the gist of, of your question, and I think... Um, the important thing is that I have that I can say to youngsters out there, in fact, to everyone in society, is that, uh, and the background is where we come from as a country, the color of our skin may not match, and our stories may be different, but our destiny is shared. Our diversity and democracy should be our cherished legacy and our chosen path. That is it. We must come together as one, and we must build this nation as one, and only as one can we achieve our goals. Um, of society, in sport, and as human beings. Absolutely agree. And before I say good day, I'm going to ask our technical producer to cue up African Dream by the uh, world-famous Lovu Choir. And uh, we're dedicating it to Alvaro, to Mohamed, and uh, to all of our students and our sports people who are, you know, enduring a very difficult time, but more so to the entire country. Simone, we are one. Uh, we'll play the song just now, but thank you very much to Alvaro Peterson and Mohamed Junaid Abai for being with us today on Unplug the Matrix. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> How do we transform our country? In the second half of Unplug the Matrix on This Is Africa Capital Radio with Shabnam Pilesa Mohamed, we are in conversation with Kasim Dokrat, who is the former president and CEO of the KZN Cricket Union and the former manager of the Pro Tiers, as well as Lawson Naidu, executive secretary of the Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution. Gentlemen, welcome to This Is Africa. Thank you. Uh, Kasim Docker, I'm going to ask you to just unmute your mic so we can hear you. Just on the screen, click on the on the mic button and uh, that could, or maybe you need to dial in, click on the button and click on the dial connection. But meanwhile, let's start the conversation with uh, Lawson Naidu. Lawson, you've heard this conversation, uh, this powerful conversation with uh, Elviro and uh, Mohammed Zunaid. Given what mm. you've heard, and what's your position? Because you've been very vocal in the last couple of weeks. What's your position on the virus of racism and in sports generally? Well, look, uh, Shabnam, I don't think we can divorce uh, racism in sport or in cricket uh, from the racism that exists in South African society. Um, you know, we're still a very deeply divided society. There are huge racial tensions in the country. Uh, but I think what we've seen and heard 
in the last two to three weeks from uh, cricketers, from former cricketers, former players, uh, some current players, uh, from coaches and administrators, is, is a sorry state of cricket in South Africa, 29 years after readmission into international cricket, uh, that this is the state of the game in the country at the moment. I think uh, it's, it's a blight on, uh, on all of us. It's a blight on uh, the administration of the game in, in this country. Uh, and uh, as I think was highlighted in the previous conversation, that Cricket South Africa, as the governing body for the sport in South Africa, has some serious questions to, to answer. And I think their responses so far um, have, have not been able to do that. Even the, the uh, uh, press statement that you referred to earlier, Shapnam, where they talked about uh, appointing an ombudsman and uh, creating uh, you know, some kind of task team to deal with these issues, I think it's a bit late in the day for that. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, whilst I, whilst I think the idea of, for example, the ombudsman is an, actually a very good one, but I think the problem is Cricket South Africa lacks any credibility to be able to run that process and put in place. I don't think anybody's going to believe them any longer. Uh, they, you know, the, the credibility is shot, and we need some kind of external uh, input into this process to give it legitimacy, to get buy-in from all South Africans, and to allow uh, players to be able to come forward and speak with freedom, uh, without fear of victimization, without fear of retaliation, and to be able to tell their story so that we can really understand what has happened and what it is that we need to do to fix it. Very important and powerful uh, opening statement there from Lawson Naidu. Kasim Dokrat, have you watched uh, the interview a little while earlier with Alviro Peterson and Mohammed Zanaid Nanabai? Did you manage to catch that? No, I did not. Uh, I tried to get onto it, but uh, I, I, I didn't. All right. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Let me then ask you then to, to respond perhaps to, to Lawson Naidu's comments. What do you think uh, of what he's saying about racism you know, in society and the CSA and the credibility of the process and the fact that it needs to be external because credibility has been lost? Would you agree with that? What are your thoughts on his opinion? Yeah, I think you know, the problem is that uh, we are now almost 30 years of, uh, one would say, democracy. Of course, you take it 25 years, but Cricket South Africa a United Cricket Board came into being in uh, 1991. And of course, uh, the mission statement at that particular time was that we are getting together and the fundamental thing is to level the playing field so that every child, whether black, white, blue or green, has the opportunity to play for his country. And that, that, that was the basis that one would say that uh, the non-aligned movement or the non-racial structures decided to go hand in hand form the United Cricket Board. Uh, unfortunately, yes, many steps have been taken over a period of time, but unfortunately, the process has been very slow. And I think what has happened recently with the BLM movement uh, that we find that slowly and gradually that black players, black administrators, and many others are coming out to show that there were many fragmentations, or there are many issues within Cricket South Africa in terms of racial harmony. Has anything changed, uh, you know, from the time you were most actively involved in cricket to now? Do you feel like there's been any change whatsoever? And if so, what, what, what has been those changes, positive and negative? Look, uh, there are many changes which has taken place. Uh, in, in, let's take it that from 1991, uh, when, of course, the problem was whether we should have had international tours or not. Come what it may, we went to India, we went to the World Cup uh, in 1992, uh, we did extremely well in 92. Of course, that time you basically was a lily white team, the only person who was in that particular team was Neil Henry. And of course, after that, you find that he took a bit of time, even to many other black players to actually play through. Uh, later on, you find that targets were put into place by Cricket South Africa to make sure that there were black players, and finally, it came to a such an extent that they also had to put a target for black African players in place. So now, basically, uh, you find that though the team is quite representative in the sense that you have more than five or maybe even in some cases, you've had, had seven players of color who are playing in the team. But what is coming out of that is that basically you're still a stranger within your team. In other words, you are not being accepted by your fellow teammates 
and you are isolated in many ways after the match, after day's game, you're still on your own, you still go home, uh, you still go to your hotel room without the others, you don't, don't dine with the others. So that has come up very strongly. Uh, by and of course, also there are times where black players have been taken to the World Cup, uh, matches that have been played, and some of them haven't played a single game and others were given a chance. So these type of uh, situations are arising day by day as we go on. And I think the lid was put off when we had this whole question of uh, Black Lives Matter. Absolutely agree with you. Some valuable insights from Kasim Dokra. So I lost and we touched on it just now. The CSA was supposed to appoint this task team. That's what I was told in my communications with them to investigate the allegations of racism. I love that word, allegations. Still allegations until they say that it's valid. Um, and uh, now there's this press statement on Friday, which you sent to me about this transformation committee. And I ran through it earlier. I mean, you know it already. You've read it, right? So there's this transformation committee, and there's going to be this project for social justice and nation building, an ombudsman, and MBZO, and uh, the restoration fund to do with opportunity costs and costs due to discrimination. I think I'm very interested to see how that's going to work because it's all about the Benjamins. Um, and these diversity programs and there's, you know, they're written to the minister and whatnot. Um, but is this the magic formula? Is this now, because of Black Lives Matter, are they now serious? Is this really going to work? Um, or in your opinion, what should, they, what should they do to actually be effective? Um, thanks, Shabra. You know, firstly, let me uh, uh, comment on what uh, Doc has just said. I mean, I think I'm, I, you know, I must agree with him. There's, there's been significant progress and change in the last 30 years, not to the extent that any of us would have liked to have seen. It's not been good enough, but there have been a lot more black players that have come into the game at a provincial level, at franchise level, and even at international level. Uh, but the conditions under which they operate are untenable. And that, to me, speaks to the institutional culture of the game in South Africa. The w white culture is still dominant in how the game is perceived, how it's run, how it's administered, and that black players are, uh, have to fit into that culture. There's no question of anybody else trying to accommodate people that come from different backgrounds, from different cultures. I mean, Hashim Amla made a significant breakthrough in getting uh, the Castle Laza emblem taken off his shirt because it was a cultural issue, a religious issue for him, a, a, an issue of fundamental principle. Uh, but that was one of the very few victories that we can really point to where we say, where we can say we forced the cricket authorities to recognize the cultural diversity that exists within the team. So it's that institutional culture for me that's got to change. So we can have quotas which are necessary, we can have all these you know, numbers and uh, imbezos and the like, but until we start to change that culture, of uh, the game in South Africa, uh, we're not gonna make any progress. But also hand in hand in this, and I want to raise an another, uh, which I think is a very important issue, uh, which uh, it, are the corporate governance failures of Cricket South Africa, not just in recent times, but going back almost a decade. Uh, we had the bonus, uh, IPL bonus scandal almost 10 years ago with the Ministerial Commission of Inquiry, the Nicholson Commission that made uh, you know, produced a report with lots of recommendations. Unfortunately, many of those recommendations have not been implemented. And therein lies some of the problems that we still face today in 2020, because Cricket South Africa thought they knew better than people, than, uh, people who were there to give them advice. Absolutely, yeah. Idris. I mean, you're raising some very important issues. Uh, Doc, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what uh, Lawson, uh, Lawson, before I forget, a, a mate of those in Australia, Kugin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been in, in touch with him recently, and he mentioned your name the other day while we were on the forum. <laughs> so I'm sure that it's a pity. I did send him a notice that we're having this. Yeah, I don't know whether he's got the time, or he's probably already asleep. He's probably the time. Uh, yeah. From there, your regards to the case. Yeah, I think what... Uh, Lawson is saying, you know, the thing is, it's a very conflict, uh, complicated issue. Because, you know, the point is that who is running Cricket South Africa today? And how many, I mean, the, and it's, I mean, I think where Lawson really touched is the question of culture. But the question is that who is administrating cricket? Yes, there was no doubt that in the beginning years, the informative years, right in the beginning, 
There are many white administrators, white presidents, etc. running. But presently, we have, a, we have a lot of about 13 to 14 colleges, which basically are run by black faculty. We have black selectors. We've recently, I mean, we, okay, Hashim, I'll come back to Hashim's situation as a captain, but including Ashwin Prince, who was the captain here and there. But basically, the question is that somewhere along the line, the strategy has failed. It has failed that because I think we we started off on the right foot. We started on the foot that we start with, we need to level the playing field. We need to start from grassroots up. We need to start from the schools and the younger people so each one had that particular uh, potential or the possibility <coughs> to play at the highest level. We, we started off that in a good way, whether it was Baker's cricket or KFC cricket or later on science or sun soil or whatever it is, they all came with different programs. But what really happened for me, and which was a major change in 2003 or 2005, when we went into franchise cricket. Now franchise cricket is a, in inverted commas, the, prof the professional wing of cricket. So what really happened then was that there were two sets. You had the amateur cricket on one side, and you had profession, professional cricket on the other side. I was a CEO of KwaZulu-Natal Cricket for many years, and I was a CEO of KwaZulu-Natal Cricket Union when this franchise did happen. But suddenly what happened to me, that while I was a CEO of KwaZulu-Natal Cricket till 2005, and suddenly when the franchise came in, and almost everybody knew me as a, as a CEO of the Dolphins rather than Kizen. So what happened is that I took the amateur, amateur side and probably gave it to another person, director of amateur cricket, you run it, go under my, under my sort of uh, uh, jurisdiction or whatever it is. But slowly and gradually, that started eroding, one would say, amateur cricket, the development of cricket, club cricket, and all that alike. And that is why today, when we talk about cricket, we only see the 15 or 20 odd players who are playing for the sports world. So that, I think, was a, a structural sort of deficiency or a decision we had taken that before we had actually done our homework, we were already running to something else. And this is was one of the critical skills and also in 1990. Should we have gone to India? Should we have gone to the World Cup when things were still not right? You know, we had the SACOS, NSC departure or, or uh, different stands taken at that particular time. So, but the point is, uh, unfortunately, as I said, there were challenging times. You had a government which has come in, which wanted certain, uh, which wanted, what do we say, certain results, wanted to move in a certain direction, and et cetera, et cetera. So virtually the leaders of non-racial, the non-racial movement, finally had to carry on, let me say, what was actually instructed at the highest level. Some very important insights coming to us there from uh, Kasim Dokrat. Um, One more thing I'll just tell you that sure. when I retired from KZN Cricket in 2009, 2010, I went to Gauteng Cricket. Now, can you imagine? We started off in 1991. By 2010, Gauteng Cricket, one of your bigger unions, prolific union, financially very strong, still didn't have the house in order in terms of non-racial cricket. And they were still lumped with a group of people, what, what we normally say it was still under white administration, totally influenced by white administrators, etc. And we were then given the task, which uh, that was uh, uh, President uh, Ray Mani, who was also the president of the ICC later on. He and myself were appointed by CSA to go there sort things out and give them a new constitution yeah. so they can follow through. We did succeed to, this, to a certain extent, which has changed quite a lot, but we come today back to square one, you know, fighting amongst each other. So, so what would you do then if suddenly you got a, you got a call up by all these big names uh, that are in that press, press statement and they say, Mr. Kasim Dokrat, you've got experience in this area. You've worked in a number of years. We trust you. We'll give you all the resources you need. Fix this problem. What would you do? You know, firstly, in fact, uh, in fact, before I came on to that, I tried to get in touch with uh, the present acting CEO, 
unfortunately didn't take my call, probably was busy and that. But what I want to say at this particular stage, we need to go back to the drawing board. And back to the drawing board means that empower the provinces again. Empower the provinces in such a way that they can tailor make their, their needs according uh, their, 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 their plans according to their needs. In other words, they know what they want. Don't throw things at them and say, this, you got, this is what you've got to do. This. They have basically become functionaries. Our presidents at the president is most of the, uh, when you say, affiliates, just throw the line, like if I may use the word. So in other words, they are no longer functional. And that is why I would first ask them, let's go back to where we were and empower the provinces, come out with a program in terms of where we're going to develop the game again. And in that case, because I think there are enough black players, black administrators who are make the mark. If you go to the Dolphin School, you know, I, I'm finding it difficult to name a white player, but I could probably name a half a dozen black players who are there on who are playing there. You know what I mean? So there are a number of players which are coming through all the time. And that should happen probably in the last maybe five years, seven years or such. But the point, point the question, the lid which has come out now is that once they get to the Chief, or once they get to the future, they don't get their expression, or they don't get where, where they're supposed to actually put in, and they're not really sort of want to say, uh, give them the, the same treatment as a white uh, player would. Do you think, uh, Doc, that women's cricket is facing the same challenges in terms of racism and discrimination? I saw that. <laughs> Uh, do you think that women's cricket, yes, we can. Do you think women's cricket is facing the same challenges in terms of racism and discrimination? Yeah, I think women's cricket is even probably worse. I think women's cricket uh, uh, started off, well, unfortunately, we were not at the same level as some of the other countries had already been as far as women's cricket. So to throw our women first to play the game, and you know, you know, and I know that, uh, you know, in terms of school sport, Basically, it was natural for telling. Yes. Uh, yeah. And probably in so-called uh, privileged schools, they had hockey. And uh, mm. uh, that's what they mostly played. So cricket came in at a very late stage. So it has become a little bit, one would say, uh, at, the, at the situation where uh, I think it's still, uh, while we have certain good cricketers, but we don't have, one would say, the cupboard is bare. There aren't too many uh, women cricketers which are coming through. It will take a time, but it is growing. The sport is growing, and I think. But I think uh, there will probably be more challenges than where uh, I think at the men. Thank you for that insight, Lawson. I do. You were given a choice, right? The people say to you, Lawson, we need you to help us lead this boycott the CSA campaign. On the other side of the table, CSA is saying to you, Lawson, we need an independent ombudsman. We need you to join us in that capacity. What would your choice be? And whichever choice you choose, what's the game plan? Well, firstly, I don't think there's a question of boycotting CSA. This is a game that belongs to all of us. And we've got to reclaim ownership of that game as cricket fans, as cricket lovers in this country. So we can't abdicate that responsibility. We can't let down the players that have taken a very brave stand to raise issues of racism and discrimination in cricket. They need our support. I would say to Cricket South Africa, you know, um, you know, try, trying to uh, uh, muddle away at the edges by p appointing an ombudsman and a task team and an MBSO without facing the, 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 the fundamental issue, which is the culture of uh, uh, institutional culture within Cricket South Africa and its affiliates, uh, without tackling the corporate governance, the massive corporate governance failures at Cricket South Africa. We've had a CEO that's been suspended on full pay for nearly eight months. It was only in the last couple of days that Cricket South Africa was able to put together a chart sheet against, uh, eight you know, the yeah. eight months. Yeah. He was suspended in December last mm. year. Uh, the board has to take responsibility for that, and they're clearly not up to the job. So I think we really have to question whether the board has the capability to lead Cricket South Africa out of this mess. My view is that they, they can't. The, the board needs to, uh, needs to resign. We need new leadership in Cricket South Africa to be able to take this, this forward. And it's not about whether uh, the members of the board are black or white or 
uh, Indian or colored. It's about whether they understand the challenges that cricket faces at the moment. I think this board has demonstrated that they don't. Uh, they've been very slow to respond to the Black Lives Matter issue. It's taken them a while to do so. And even when they have, uh, it's, it's quite clear that they don't grasp the scale and the depth Absolutely of the Absolutely agree with you. The board needs to go. We need to replace it with people that are passionate about cricket yeah, diversity, yeah. inclusion, and transformation. Doc? Yeah, what I would like to come in and support Lawson on that is that yes, the board needs to go. And, and we know that particular board. But the question is, but who do we replace that board? Now, I can only say, of course, from experience that if we go around the country and if we don't look at the present setup at most of the provinces, we're not going to get people of the caliber which Lawson is talking about. Uh, that this has happened because, as I said, that over a period of time, uh, the unions have not been empowered. The leaders haven't come through. And this, it's, it's yes. By the way, what I would like to see that even whether we may not want to want to have this, whether there's a government intervention or whatever it is, that we need to put a set of administrators, people who who, who know the game also, but at the same time know the structural aspect of how to uh, run as an organizer because. One must understand it's not a club we're running on. This is a multi-million uh, organization which you've got to administrate. And therefore, we need to do it properly now. And that is and why- And they've got to be I accountable think, to the nation. They've got to be accountable. And that is why I think get the best people, get some administrators from all walks of life, whether they be from the top, corporate, legal, sporting world, get a group of people who have the same uh, view, not the same views, but one would say the same goals. For cricket, and if they can Absolutely. come in and they plan together and have sort of a, a cooling period as far as the topics are concerned, I think there's an opportunity we can get to where we want. I hope they listen to the show. We'll be sending you the link so you can send it on to them. I want to say thank you to Kasim Dokrat and Lawson Naidu for joining us and unplug the matrix on This Is Africa Today. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. So this has been the first edition of This Is Africa. The gentlemen would uh, leave the studio now so we can round up before the next show. Thank you very much. <laughs>